in history. But the military is constantly adapting to the potential wars of tomorrow. At research labs and military installations around the world, the technology, training, and tactics of tomorrow are being tested today. This is an inside look at the 21st century warfighter. At a remote base in southern Germany, this unit is on a 21st century mission to rescue hostages captured at a U.S. embassy. Get down, get down, get down, play more! Stay down, stay down, head down. Ahead. We got artillery coming in friendly. Give me status! Give me status! Move out! But this is no uncoordinated romp in the woods. Every step they take, every action, is monitored get out, get out. and recorded on a sophisticated electronic network. Firing laser beams and wearing transmitters and receivers, the soldiers relay every detail of their battlefield. We made it to the distraction point, you're safe. Cool. In a small tent crammed with the latest computer technology, the troops' trainers record every move, analyze every shot fired. This right here is a uh, personal detection device. This is basically the main component of the system. Um, it has uh, laser sensors right here that pick up laser beams that are fired by this right here, which is the uh, small arms transmitter. Basically, when he pulls the trigger, a laser beam comes out the end. When the mission is over, the participants are graded on their exercise more accurately than ever before in what they call an after-action review. You saw he engaged him. Another successful engagement. And you can see by the, the X's on each of the, the icons that all three of the target kits have been successfully engaged. The stakes here are very high. They learn what they did right and wrong. Some were shot and killed. Soldier down! Others critically wounded. But failing in this virtual world will help them succeed in the real world and may save their lives in combat. It allows you to be able to tell exactly where you're shooting, where you're hitting, because a lot of times you get into an urban area with previous systems, somebody would get hit or killed, and you wouldn't know who did it. The high-tech training taking place at the U.S. base in Germany is just one facet of the changes underway as the military defines the next generation of combatants. They call it war fighting, and it's a mindset that adapts to an ever-changing enemy. Men such as the chief army scientist, the army's best trainers, and leaders of important military bases introduce and explain the changes as tomorrow's troops lock and load for the future. It's more of a decentralized fight. It's a faceless enemy. Uh, terrorism, uh, counterinsurgency, and those are very difficult enemies to fight against. The war fighters of tomorrow will be smart, well equipped, and connected. It really is a force that is very high tech in its capabilities, and all those capabilities will be embedded not only in platforms, but in the individual soldier. The 21st century warfighter will not only have technology at his disposal, it will also be part of his gear and his uniform. As in Land Warrior, the U.S. Army's integrated soldier system. It starts with a Kevlar helmet, equipped with a wireless antenna and a video display. On the shoulder is a GPS transponder. Attached to the rifle is a camera system for day and night vision. Also, there is a computer mouse by the trigger to allow for differing views of the video display. Instead of exposing your whole body to engage a target, you can now take your arms out and keep the rest of your body uh, hidden and look through your daylight video sight camera through your helmet mount display to see what's out there in that room. Land Warrior operates on its own battle net. A soldier is able to send and receive messages and images via a wireless computer hookup to any and all squad members. This allows every member to see exactly what the others are seeing. 
They're trying very hard to go ahead and integrate a wearable ensemble of computers, GPS equipment, wireless communications and navigation devices to help enhance the situational awareness and firepower of the individual infantrymen. To reach these goals, the armed forces have reorganized their infrastructure, upgrading critical training centers to go with the new technology. Those training centers have revolutionized the way we as an Army train uh, soldiers, leaders, and forces for operations uh, around the world. It really is a different way of thinking about how you conduct the fight from the way we've done it in the past. This revolution includes a new battle space, virtual reality. Simulations allow you to practice the tasks that you are going to perform uh, when you go to war. The more realistic training that we can give our soldiers that are going to be going back into the combat role, uh, the more prepared they'll be, and actually, uh, we could actually be saving lives. One of the most advanced simulations is the firearms training system, FATS for short. Using a combination of lasers, video, and computers, FATS gives soldiers cutting-edge training on a wide array of weapons. From small arms to convoy gunnery. These virtual weapons are not only good training, they're also extremely cost-effective. The realism afforded by 21st century simulations offers all the benefits of shooting live ammo and training without the high cost per round. It may look like a video game, but these games can mean the difference between life and death. Games are pretty powerful training medium. That is something that we're starting to pioneer on behalf of the Army. All this combines to make the 21st century warfighter a more effective fighting unit better trained, better equipped, and better prepared for the uncertainties and challenges that lie ahead. Three, two, one. my position one. for about... Boom! The full might of modern warfare first appeared in Operation Desert Storm. As massive and amazingly accurate payloads were unleashed on an unsuspecting enemy. Through images beamed into the world's living rooms, Desert Storm showed the technology and tactics adapted to it could defeat large armies and defend friendly forces against enemy attack. Overseen by a mammoth technological umbrella, coalition troops raced across the sands of Kuwait and Iraq. Operation Desert Storm became a proving ground for new armaments. It was swift and decisive, but as methodical as the coalition advance appeared, it may not have been so efficient without aid from a technology that is now a household name. Global Positioning System, or GPS, has proven to be a crucial component of a modern military. 24 GPS satellites far above Earth's atmosphere beam down a constant barrage of geographical data to GPS receivers on the ground. This data translates into a specific location on the surface of the globe. The space-based navigation system allows soldiers and commanders to determine their precise location at all times. GPS is now an integral tool for the 21st century warfighter. But its perks extend far beyond human soldiers. Using this latest technology, thousands of stockpiled conventional bombs have been upgraded to give them minds of their own. One of the most fearsome weapons to emerge in the war in Afghanistan is known as the JDAM, the Joint Direct Attack Munition. A bolt-on tail assembly contains a GPS guidance system, which receives target coordinates directly from the pilot of a launch aircraft. Once dropped, the bomb knows exactly where they are and where to go calculating their own trajectory with a range of 15 miles. But no technology has yet been devised that can eliminate the need for the warfighter on the ground, the warrior in harm's way.
Throughout time, a series of questions have repeatedly bedeviled troops in the fog of war. Where am I? Where are my buddies? Where is the enemy? A great leap forward in providing these answers came with a new system known as Blue Force Tracking. Working through a computer system known as the Tactical Internet, satellite communications successfully maintain Blue Force awareness. Data flows from individual users through satellite comlinks to data fusion centers and back, and via satellite to all commanders on the network. It is a digital view of the troops. This system provides those answers across the battlefront spectrum, to grunts on the ground, to their immediate commanders, and even up the chain to generals and the Pentagon itself. Using the latest up-to-date data available, it can be started at the very beginning stages in the planning of an operation. Sir, your mission data is loaded and your graphics is up. Whoa, thanks, Warden. Whoa. Sergeant Finn, let me show you where I need you to recon. Cool, sir. I need you to push out some OPs to cover our flank. It gives commanders near real-time information on what is happening on the front line. While Blue Force uses GPS satellites and high technology to quickly and efficiently distribute vital information, much of that data must also be gathered in the first place. Where, for example, is the enemy? Enter the Predator. A plane that could fly low and close to enemy positions without risking the lives of pilots and provide the intelligence it gathered immediately without delays. The Predator is a long-range unmanned aircraft that carries cameras and a satellite link. It can send real-time video to commanders anywhere in the world. At any moment, day or night, a Predator is probably flying, sending the information it gathers back to the Pentagon. As simple as it looks, it is no toy. Predator's a, a marvel. It's, a, it's an amazing aircraft. It's a, not a toy. It's a, not a remote control a toy, as some people think. We offer real-time video down to the troop commanders. That's never been done before. Besides being the eyes of the warrior, we are an information system that he has never had access to before that allows him to make better decisions. The Predator also has become part of the lexicon in Afghanistan and Iraq. As popular as they are with the troops, however, they are limited in number. So smaller, perhaps more primitive versions are now being used by Special Forces A-teams and some Marine units. One of the latest is known as Dragon Eye. Dragon Eye is a five and a half pound backpackable unmanned air vehicle designed to be able to fit into a Marine's pack. It enables a company commander or a platoon commander to take this capability with them into the fight so that they can use it to look over the next hill or over the next building. The operators pull the Dragon Eye out of their backpack. They assemble it. It's made in five pieces. We have two cameras on the aircraft, one that looks forward and one that looks to the side. What we send back to the ground control station is 30 frames per second NTSC video uh, in the real time. Three, two, one. Even this small aircraft gives the warfighter an unparalleled view of his terrain and surrounding danger. So too does surveillance and reconnaissance ground equipment, known more affectionately by its acronym, SARGE. It's a remotely controlled reconnaissance and surveillance unmanned platform, and its primary mission is to go forward of our scout forces and our reconnaissance forces, check the situation out before they proceed. Like unmanned aircraft, these remote-controlled robotic vehicles also use night vision and GPS equipment. Sarge may well be the first of a long line of such equipment in all shapes and sizes, such as Sarge's nephew, Dragon Runner. The vehicle's invertible, there's no active suspension, and the reason why is it is tossable. Toss it into a window or onto a rooftop. Uh, in the front of the vehicle, you have in the center a low light wide angle video camera, infrared LED for night use. You have the motion sensor and a directional microphone so the Marine can listen remotely. It also has motion sensors on uh, both sides. 
it's used for interior exploration or reconnaissance uh, of buildings. If Marines were inside a building and they needed to get uh, situational awareness of what was outside a building, you could easily throw it from a second story building or window and drive it on away. Dragon Runner can also be used uh, to explore the underside or the undercarriage of vehicles. The vehicle actually drives by a group of people and I think out of three, only one saw it go by. Whether using miniature robots or giant satellite-based protection systems, the 21st century warfighter has come a long way. But those who train these warriors know best, there's still a long way to go. Armies have fought one another since before recorded history. Young men have been sent into harm's way as generals planned, plotted, and ordered the assaults. For the ground troops, Training often amounted to no more than being taught how to use a rifle. For the individual soldier, forcing his way through the mud and the blood, the best arsenal he had consisted of his weapon and his boots. But much has changed. Today's forces are not your grandfather's army. As times have changed, so have the demands. To better prepare the average soldier, and to better equip him for new types of battles and enemies. For the duration of the Cold War, from the 1950s to the turn of the century, America prepared to fight a massive conventional war, most probably in Europe and most likely against the Soviet Union. But today's and tomorrow's battlefields are far more likely to be in rugged mountains and valleys or the back streets of a distant city. We're not doing large formations, mechanized fights uh, at the Combat Maneuver Training Center because that's not what units will experience when they go into Afghanistan, Iraq, and, and the Balkans. Unlike battles of the past, war today can break out anywhere, anytime. Today we have many threats around the world and it's uncertain where the action might be next year or the year after next. And we have to be prepared to move into theater quickly and respond quickly. They now need specialized training, customized to the enemy, his tactics, and the environment in which they will meet. Some of the most critical training for the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan is being conducted at U.S. bases in southern Germany. The training here is especially important because the location is only hours away from where these troops will deploy. For many soldiers, it's their last stop before being sent into a combat zone. As the operations group commander here, Colonel Davis is responsible for all combat maneuver training. As we look into uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, obviously the threats are different. We obviously replicate the insurgent activity that is present in the theater. They are training to look for suspicious activity in an urban setting and how to subdue a suspect if needed. Learning to control a crowd in this hostile environment is a critical skill. They learn how to deal with the worst of the enemy's new methods. Some of the activities that, that we really focus on here uh, is improvised explosive devices or killing soldiers. We weave in that element within the complex environment of the rotation so they experience those kinds of activities uh, during the rotation they do occur with enough repetition that the units can develop tactics, techniques, and procedures to defeat these kinds of threats. Sniper activities within urban areas like the ones we're standing in right here, ambushes uh, going to and from urban centers, and also logistics convoys that uh, these kinds of threats are a daily occurrence in Afghanistan and Iraq. So we have to replicate those kinds of threats in this environment, in the training environment, once the unit's here to train. The wars in Afghanistan and Iraq have taught them how much they must change and what the 21st century warfighter must learn. They keep close tabs on every new development in the war zones so they can get it right. We sent our planners to Afghanistan into the area that they're going to operate so we could get with the units that are down there now, see what right looks like, and then we go through a process of exercise design, exercise development, script writers that provide the orders and, and those types of things that really provide the structure of the, of the rotation. And our measure of effectiveness 
of whether or not we're doing our job is when we talk to that unit in Afghanistan and they say that the exact same things they trained on here at the Combat Maneuver Training Center are the things that they're experiencing in Afghanistan and that we, were, we had it right. The new warfighters have a long list of training tools, from traditional firing lines to new computerized simulators that put them virtually in the center of the action they will later face. More and more bases in the Army are being utilized, some with unusual benefits. In the wilds of Wyoming, Camp Guernsey offers mirror images of distant hot spots. Training space is at a premium, and one of the things that customers come to Camp Guernsey for is, is the, the terrain that uh, we offer. We replicate Afghanistan, uh, northern Iraq, Bosnia. We have a lot of diverse terrain, and customers come here because of that. We've got this the simulation building uh, that offers a lot of uh, the latest uh, technologies in, in simulations for individual weapons training. We've got the, uh, the modified record of fire range, which is a computerized uh, pop-up target range for individual weapon qualification. Um, we've got the convoy live fire range that we've recently installed. One of the things we're working on for the future is a, a mount site, a military operations in urban terrain. Uh, it's a, basically a town that soldiers can go in and train uh, in urban combat because that is one of the most dangerous and complex training or real world s situations that a soldier has to go through. Uh, certainly there's no substitute for on the ground training. No substitute for putting real bullets down range. However, the more effective that training can be, the more effective those rounds can be going down range, uh, the better the soldiers are going to be prepared. Now, how they can accomplish that is by utilizing a virtual training environment. The horizons of this virtual world stretch from small arms ranges. Weapon three, 47 rounds fired, nine hits, four kills. Weapon four, 60 rounds fired, one hit and one kill. To a driver's point of view in a Humvee or a tank. This here is, is supposed to get you ready to that you know what you're doing. And uh, that's, what, that's what these are designed for. So you're not going into a brand new system and not have any idea what to do. You come here, you train, and uh, they prepare you for war. To interaction with artificial intelligence. What happened here? That is a tool. There was an accident, sir. That allows a soldier to act with a set of virtual humans in a complex environment and react as he would normally react, make decisions, and then get feedback from the avatars, that is the synthetic humans in the, ar in the environment, uh, responding to his actions, to his decisions. Sergeant, send two squads forward. Sir, that is a bad idea. We shouldn't split our forces and it uses speech recognition and speech generation technology so he can interact with them just like he would with a real human. The keys there are that it uses realistic graphics and artificial intelligence to drive the behavior of the avatars in the simulation so that they make reasonable decisions and can provide feedback on the reasons for their decisions. One of the most critical aspects of training for the 21st century warfighter is learning how to deal with attacks on convoys, especially in urban environments, where U.S. troops are frequently ambushed and roadside bombs are commonplace. Military trainers hope to turn the tables. In their simulators, with the aid of 21st century technology, troops can prepare for and learn to protect themselves against these terrorist acts. One of the latest training techniques is to use one of the younger generation's favorite pastimes, computer games. But the soldiers quickly learn that these games are deadly serious. The life of a soldier is unique. It's a tight circle, rarely breached by outsiders, and understood little by those who have not walked the walk. But now, with the help of modern technology, 
ordinary civilians have a chance to get an inkling of what it is like to march into harm's way. These are computer game developers who were tasked with creating a game representing the U.S. Army. That game is simply called America's Army. They have come to Camp Guernsey in Wyoming to get a better understanding of life as a war fighter. When America's Army decided to create the new game, we went outside and tried to get some of the brightest minds in the industry to try to create a very realistic game that would be able to uh, take the United States Army's message and present that in a very realistic first-person shooter game to the American public. Roger that. The designers pride themselves in particular on the authenticity of the game. We are the first game that is the Army talking about itself. You know, we're not Hollywood talking about the Army. We're not some game company who has some idea about what the Army is. You know, we are now, you know, the Army describing itself. America's Army was first seen on the Internet where it quickly gained enormous popularity as downloadable software. America's Army is extremely popular. Right now we have about 4.7 million registered users. We're adding about 100,000 users per month. And I think the reason for that popularity is, first and foremost, that our, you, our players realize that this is the real Army's depiction of itself in a video game. And that realism, that authenticity comes across in the way we construct the game and the way the game looks and feels. My first impression was the quality of the graphics and the realism. Uh, I do a lot of shooting and the way that the firearms were portrayed and manipulated and all the accessories was just right spot on. But these are no pale imitations of what warfighters endure. These games are so thorough and so authentic, they are now being used to help train 21st century warfighters themselves. Those types of tools that they're developing in, for industry purposes can be applied to the next generation of training systems for the Army. But America's Army is much more than it first appears. America's Army is a, uh, a powerful, uh, military action game technology uh, that the Army's using for public communication about its uh, values and, uh, and the, the ethos of the organization and now extending into other applications for training, mission rehearsal, and weapons modeling. The use of America's Army as a training tool has, according to troops who have used it, been a great success. There are several stages of the virtual training. Let's take marksmanship, for example. You can use several different training devices for marksmanship to, to hone your marksmanship skills. The uh, America's Army trainer actually utilizes the soldier's weapon. A drop-in bolt kit is put in, but the zero is not changed on the soldier's weapon. He's actually uh, firing the weapon that he will be firing on his qualification. So that's a, that's a breakthrough in, uh, in virtual training. Of course, nothing can totally match the raw adrenaline of being on the front line of an alley in Fallujah or in a darkened river wadi in eastern Afghanistan. But the ingredients and challenges are there in this digital world. So if they were to be taken seriously by the troops they were about to help train, even the best in the world of computer games needed some specialized training of their own. They had to learn the nuances and first-person experiences of life in uniform. So we went out and hired a great team, but we needed to green up that team. We really needed to integrate them into the Army as deeply as we could. The stakes were high not just for the inventors, but also for the future warfighters. What is so important about what our developers are doing with the game is that they are actually impacting how soldiers will train how, how they prepare for the combat role. And that's a byproduct of uh, great integration of our development team into the Army, the very fabric of the Army. And we bring those developers in and we task them to uh, create a very realistic game, very realistic products, because uh, we have to have realism in training. Otherwise, it's not training. And it's not going to be as effective as we want it to be. For the majority of computer whiz kids, they're starting from scratch. The frame of reference that a lot of these uh, developers have is not from the military. It's from the movies. It's from what they see on TV. So uh, that's not the message particularly that we want to send. So what we do is we do these screening up events. 
then I'll give you a little brief on what we're going to do with you today and tomorrow to help you get the Army experience. Our intent is to uh, get you the experience you need to go back and do your jobs. We put them into an Army environment. We try to put them in front of as many uh, uh, of the actual weapon systems and different platforms that they will replicate in the game, and we want them to be immersed into that experience. The only way they're going to be able to do that is by actually coming and participating in these events themselves. That rifle right in the crook of your shoulder, with that post right in the center of the target. Okay, go ahead and put it in. Okay, now I don't need to load it. All right, I don't need to charge. They may be developing training and techniques for 21st century warriors, but they start with age-old commands. And squeeze the trigger. Good. If we're out here holding the weapons ourselves, actually firing them, feeling the recoil, uh, getting a sense of, of what that means, uh, you know, the much better chance we have of, of getting that right in the game. The developers are having a great experience. They're having a lot of fun. As a matter of fact, most of the developers consider the Green Up events a bonus and a benefit to the job of working for the America's Army uh, project. And uh, I want it to be fun for them. You know, they're going to they're come here, they're going to be able to experience the different weapon systems, they're going to be able to go on uh, convoy operations, fly in helicopters. I mean, it's a great experience for them and it is a lot of fun. To make the America's Army game authentic and relevant, the developers had to learn about the biggest dangers facing real troops on the ground. Of particular concern are ambushes and improvised explosive devices known as IEDs. One of the tasks that the developers were really interested in uh, getting involved in is convoy operations. We've tasked them to create a convoy simulator to uh, simulate an ambush or improvised explosive device attack on a convoy. But the Army did not stop at the drawing board. They took them out on the road to the type of environment where it could really occur. So today, we put the developers in a convoy. It was a seven-vehicle convoy that uh, was actually ambushed uh, by some opposing forces. But they actually went through the ambush, they returned some fire, and, and were able to get out of the kill zone. They actually saw what it was like to feel helpless in that kind of scenario, and uh, they, they got a lot out of it. I'm around the experience of the Army via the game, but I'm never out in the trenches to say, to really get a hands-on look, get to feel the weapons, fire the weapons, get an idea of what it's like just to go through the day of the Army. Um, yesterday was about a 16-hour day, and I think it's good for us to experience what someone in the Army goes through in that regard. We make the game more realistic by doing these type of things because now we get to experience these things firsthand. We get to see how a weapon works, we get to see how a helicopter flies, we get to see how a convoy runs, and then we get to apply that and, and tweak those values, of course, considering gameplay at the same time. These enthusiastic young inventors are exploring new frontiers. But as daring as their work is, it's only the beginning of what lies ahead. What is now emerging from the military's secret research and development labs. For as long as men have gone to battle, they have sought ways to protect themselves against the enemy and his weapons. From medieval knights, to both World War I and World War II, and on to Vietnam. The system has not yet been invented that would not only save lives, but also guard against crippling wounds until now. The body armor used currently by U.S. forces has proven invaluable, but it's still heavy and cumbersome and often slows down a warrior on the move. We have in the field today something called the interceptor body armor. It's a set, it's a vest with a set of plates that you stick in it that actually protect the soldier against gunfire. And there are many examples of soldiers' lives being saved from bullets and fragments due to the presence of that body armor. But a new type of armor is on the drawing boards for the 21st century warfighter. Working at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, scientists are using a new frontier known as nanotechnology to create new lightweight body armor. We have the folks at MIT in the Institute for Soldier Nanotechnology who are exploring new types of materials, uh, designing them from the ground up so you'd take something that'd be normally as flexible as this coat, and if it was struck by a bullet, would instantly become as hard as armor and deflect a fragment. But the research doesn't stop here. 
Well, the Army's uh, really put a, a good challenge out, and it's to protect the individual dismounted infantry soldier and uh, to protect from uh, ballistic, uh, chemical, biological, to enhance his survivability. To do that, scientists are developing an entire battle suit that not only protects the soldier, but can also detect and diagnose injuries and then apply life-saving measures automatically. As hopeful as it all sounds, however, it could be years before such protection makes it out of the research lab. Nonetheless, research continues on this front and a multitude of other projects. At Auburn University in Alabama, scientists have been working for several years on developing what they call a smart bullet. The new bullet would be unaffected by wind and gravity and will automatically follow a moving target. It will allow an infantryman to identify a target with a laser beam and the bullet will hone in on the reflection. While a sniper takes up his position, his spotter will identify the target. Once the target is chosen, there is no way it can escape. Using tiny built-in electronic seekers, the nose of the bullet moves independent of its main body. The smartest parts of the bullet are called actuators. They are what steer the bullet to its destination. They work very much like human muscle tissues. Uh, one will contract, the other will expand. And very much like in your forearm, your bicep will contract and your tricep will expand, and it'll rotate my elbow around my forearm. Same thing happens in the guided bullet. Uh, one fuse electric element will expand, the other will contract and rotate the nose around the pivot to follow the target. This will increase a smart bullet's range to twice that of a conventional cartridge. No longer would you need huge magazines of, of rounds to carry around. Just one or two would do the job. In the case of a smart armor-piercing bullet, a guaranteed hit from a single shot to a tank's magazine is all it would take. And the technological revolution continues. Edwards Air Force Base. It is the home of the Air Force's Flight Testing Center, where they have long pushed the limits of fighter technology. Centered on a huge, dried-up lake, this is where virtually every experimental U.S. plane first flies. Powerful and increasingly compact computers, along with new propulsion technology, are leading to greater and greater advances in unmanned fighter design. This is the X-36, the next step on the road to a pilotless fighter plane, flown by a virtual pilot. We created a virtual cockpit. Uh, the virtual cockpit has a uh, flight uh, quality uh, control stick with uh, damping and, and uh, force feel in it. Uh, we have uh, throttle and all have feel identical to what you'd have in a real manned airplane. The virtual pilot on the ground uses a television camera. Whatever the X-36 sees, I see on that monitor. Everything that you'd need in a real flying airplane. The X-36 is designed to reduce its profile on radar, making it not only stealthier, but also faster. Usually in the old days when you had to do something to reduce the signature, there was a penalty involved with it, and there was a lot of trade-offs. But as we got into taking the tails off the airplane, we also found out there were a couple other benefits. We found out that we could do, reduce the drag and reduce the weight of the airplane. So it came out to be a real payoff. As it moves through development, the X-36 is shrouded in secrecy. The special nozzle that we uh, co-developed with McDonnell Douglas is one of the more classified elements of the program. It uh, is a very elegant, simple design yet it provides very high rates of actuation and a very large amount of gas angle deflection, which all uh, adds up to a very effective thrust vectoring system. And beyond that, we really can't say much more about it. 
Faster and more agile UAVs are not the only objective. Some research is even moving towards small, insect-like flying machines. Very small unmanned air vehicles, what's been called micro unmanned air vehicles. Uh, there's been sort of the standard joke is, if it's micro, it by definition is unmanned. You can't sort of have both. It has to do with what's called the micro UAV. Uh, the extremely small uh, unmanned airplane that has a characteristic dimension on the order of 15 centimeters or six inches. Some of these are just little gliders. They look like kids' toys. Some of them are powered with motors. Uh, basically, we're trying different concepts right now to see what makes sense from the aerodynamics and structure standpoint. Later on, we'll be integrating actual sensors, small cameras, small listening devices, other things on here that make them a useful tool. Pro flyer level, a paradigm shift occurs where it might make more sense now to try and create air vehicles that mimic uh, what we find in creation. Uh, things with flapping wings or things like dragonflies with uh, fixed wings that vibrate rapidly. And so micro flyers very well may take that form. It may seem like science fiction, but plans are underway for the uses of such tiny machines. Various concepts have been put forward uh, for tiny air vehicles that could act perhaps as a fly on the wall and used in covert operations that would fly into a building. This would be unmanned aerial vehicles that uh, grow smaller and smaller to approach the size of insects to fix themselves to a ceiling or a wall of an area that they have been drawn to by uh, pheromones given off by human beings, perhaps. With high technology making quantum leaps at every turn, the question must be asked, could the day come when machinery takes over as a future warfighter? Perhaps in the form of robots? Identify yourself. Robots that can, for example, see and hear. They come in all shapes and sizes. Some look a lot like battle tanks. Others like farm machinery. Even like trash compactors. But they are all robots. In a future war, they could all be smart enough to fight each other or us. At the Space and Naval Warfare Center in San Diego, design engineers have wired up robotic eyes that can spot a moving human and decide that it is different to branches of a tree waving in the breeze. It is still being perfected. You basically have to walk before you run. There's a lot of issues that we have not yet solved that I think need to be solved first before we start making these things even smarter. Already, there are robots that can pack a paintball gun and engage in battle with other robots. These demonstrations are staged to make the point that a GI robot might eventually be possible. The real thing is, of course, more than a decade away. The primary purpose in robotics is to take the soldier out of harm's way. And in, in saying that, I mean areas of um, hazardous conditions, which might be a biological condition or a chemical or a nuclear condition. So we're looking at robotic applications for those things and also for wartime weapons carrying capabilities. Creating a weapon with enough brains to be a true warfighter will be a formidable challenge. Sophisticated tools, some beyond imagination a few years ago, are being implemented for the 21st century warfighter. The new generation of warriors will have the newest generation of computers and equipment at their service. And I see simulations growing to a point where sometime in the future, uh, these simulations will be embedded in the command and control systems that we currently have, and that we'll be able to train as we fight, while we're fighting, before, during, and after the fight, um, in a very high degree of fidelity. It's the soldier that's the most important thing in this, in this day and age and in this conflict. It's not the M1 tank and it's not the Bradley or the Stryker fighting vehicle or the Apache helicopter. It's the soldier and everything that we do needs to enable the soldier to conduct his mission, gain intelligence, paint the right picture so that leaders can make decisions.